Hi everyone, welcome to another interviewing Spotlight series. Um, super excited to confirm that we have James Hennigan with us this morning, uh, Managing Director of SCC um, of, uh, within two divisions, Hyperscale and uh, Cyber. Um, James, welcome. I know you're really, really busy. Thanks so much for uh, taking the chance to, uh, yeah, get under the spotlight. Uh, a very quick overview of SCC, but I'm sure you'll give us a, a more detailed rundown. SCC, uh, for the audience, a multi-award winning IT solutions provider operating out of, uh, I think, over 65 countries, delivering IT solutions in partnership with some of the world's leading technology vendors. So areas that they cover, data center, modernization, networks and communication, workspace productivity, business process outsourcing, security, and uh, they innovate these solutions across the public and private industry. So, James, welcome. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, taking time out of your day. Um, I'd like to kick things off with, uh, yeah, maybe a quick overview of uh, of yourself and your career so far. Yeah, sure. Uh, welcome, Tim. Um, so, I've been in this industry for, well, probably longer than I would want to admit, but in the last sort of 15 years, um, from, from originally starting at Microsoft themselves, um, which is a business we're all still fairly close to. Um, but for the last 10 plus years, I've been in the MSP channel. Um, yep. So working with a range of partners across a range of technologies, but typically around cloud, cybersecurity, data, UC, um, often with uh, some alignment at some point with Microsoft, not exclusive to, but Microsoft obviously is in all of those places and continues to do well. Um, and I've typically, as a, as a career, started from more of a product management and, and pre-sales environment and then, and then gone okay. through various roles, more into general management and, and leadership to the position I'm in today where I lead those two businesses within cybersecurity and public cloud within FCC. Fantastic. Brilliant. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I've had the pleasure of working with you uh, over over quite a few years uh, uh, within the channel. And uh, yeah, it's just refreshing to hear from you how well you've done and sort of lived and breathed the MSB IT solution by the space for so long. And uh, yeah, I suppose one of the key questions, how did you get into the industry? You know, what, what, what made you step into the MSP world and out of vendor? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think um, there's two steps, really. I think there's the initial step when you, it's very, very true probably for a few people, when you leave university and you think, what am I actually going to do as a proper job? Yeah, um, yeah. And I think I was in that camp probably very similar to a lot of people. Um, knew I was going to do something in and around technology, but that's very, very broad. And, and I think at that point, lots of the corporates, Microsoft in particular, offered a ramp into this world, which was where you didn't have to commit everything to going into a job. You didn't even know what it was. Um, so from my starting career, going into Microsoft in the early days was a really good platform to see the whole market um, through the lens that Microsoft see it, which is obviously broad, meet a lot of people doing a lot of different things and a lot of interesting things. And that gave me a footing into the MSP space. So I was working with MSPs. I was working with Microsoft on emerging technologies. We could see that it was a um, the market was fairly early and there was lots of innovation going on. Um, and it kind of felt like that was, was a good place to be. And I've, I've been there ever since. Yeah, absolutely. I have to say, I mean, all we've ever done, as you know, interview is specialise in, in the channel and all of our clients are MSP IT solution providers. And uh, yeah, it's certainly a crazy world out there right now. I mean, everyone hiring, everyone looking for the same sort of people. And I think the pace and the urgency, what we tend to find is when uh, individuals leave the vendor and go into that MSP IT solution, but they either kind of sort of love it or think, guys, <laughs> this pace is a bit too fast. But um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you've certainly adapted and uh, absolutely uh, smashed through the years on that side. Um, cool. So look, from a, from a business perspective, I mean, you know, certainly we're seeing a huge amount of change um, at the moment. And uh, I, know, I definitely don't want to make this video um, about COVID. You know, I think we're sort of uh, very much out the back of that but from a very positive side, I think we've seen the change, we've adapted, et cetera. But um, certainly over the years, um, sort of being part of SEC's growth and, and, and transformation, I, I've seen a huge amount of change. You know, what, 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 what's the focus? What's the core focus for the business currently to date? Yeah, so as you, you, you know, you rightly um, described at the start of the, the call, um, SEC are probably the largest privately owned IT services business in Europe. Um, yeah. 47 years old, still owned privately by the family, which is, is great. And I think to your point, what is one of the biggest challenges of a company that's been in IT for 47 years? It's navigating the change and keeping pace with it. Now, SEC's yeah. got a track record of that, having been in this space for so long, it's seen a lot of changes and 
being able to help its customers really successfully through a lot of those changes. Um, but at the minute, and specifically for me in public cloud and cybersecurity, that rate of change in capability of technologies, what's coming to the market, the needs of our customers, um, has probably never been quicker. Um, right. And we need to obviously be ahead of that to be able to help our customers understand where they need to go and help them on that journey. And that's probably one of the most challenging things that's facing our industry and you know businesses in this space at the minute. Naturally, with your alignment into this, the skills sorted we see in the UK is another big challenge, right? So yeah. Well, pivoting into those places and moving at pace, um, having the people that can fulfill the requirements that we have is is obviously key as well. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's 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 right that you mentioned in terms of the skill shortage. Um, you know, I think a lot of people tend to quickly put their hands up and say, you know, it's a candidate scarce market. There aren't any new candidates out there, which, which which I don't think is the case. I just think because a lot of businesses are going through a huge transformation, you know, lots of change within their company, new divisions, new areas, um, and then trying to sort of recruit those people at the pace that they need to facilitate their customers. That's where it becomes what I call a bit of a skill shortage because we just can't get them quick enough. Um, and that's why we always say, look, businesses should be uh, um, promoting within and putting the right training and development in place to get their current individuals upskilled in the areas that make sense for them, the business and the customers. So yeah, well, I, I, you know, that leads me on to when we mentioned customers, you know, what, what is, what is the, it's a, it's a difficult question, but what, what, what does the perfect client look like for, for SEC, whether that be size, vertical or both? Yeah, I think for us, the, the target client in that SME space, and what I mean by SMC space is sort of below the enterprise global corporate businesses, which we, we do service some of those, but SEC, it's, SEC is still a, a UK and European centric business at its heart. Yeah. Um, and I think some of our customers that we've had great track records with over the many, many years are those businesses that have large complex IT needs. So they're yeah. fairly large businesses that we would class in that um, lower enterprise or SMC space. Um, and above that general mid market space where there is a fair amount of competition in the MSP market so i think scc's differentiator in that is it has bigger scale and breadth of capability in its size okay. of the typical mid-market msp yep. um we aren't typically competing with the global SIs. i have more interest in the global enterprises and i think that's a, a real gap in the market where scc just serves its customers extremely well brilliant yeah no absolutely and i think it's important to understand the target audience and uh you know, go after the, the the businesses that you can facilitate to the highest possible standard. I mean, certainly in a very competitive market as well. So, yeah, and and in terms of challenges, you know, um, you know, what have yourself or and SEC had to sort of overcome, you know, over the last few years? Let's start with the business. Yeah, well, I mean, you said let's not talk about it, but you can't not talk about it, can you? So, I think they <laughs> got that question at the minute. It says COVID and and sort of yeah. the broader impact of that not just obviously COVID in terms of the way it changed people's working behaviors is is one of the things not just dealing with obviously the, the changes in the people being off sick and the change obviously to to the rate of people investing and so forth but we just saw that massive shift in the way that people were working right so certain traditional business lines which were well catered to people being in offices really mm -hmm. suffered and others obviously had to grow quickly to cater for the need of helping our customers work remotely. And that's, you know, we're still seeing the impacts of those changes flow through, right? People are still working in that hybrid dynamic way. We are seeing people going back into offices, but we're seeing it at different rates of change. Um, and I think as a business, being able to, to adapt to that quickly showed how certain businesses were able to be more agile and others, others struggled more, right? And it also depended which parts of the market you're in. SCC... Yep typically serves a range of customers across a range of uh, industry verticals, which is, is great when you, you know, have certain impact high in certain verticals and less so in others, certain verticals grew and certain verticals um, contracted. So they were very, relatively well shielded from that perspective, but naturally as with all IT services business, it did change the mix of work that was being requested and we had to be agile in that regard. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and look, I think that was sort of uh broadly discussed across you know the whole world if i'm honest you know uh in terms of uh you know when covid hit us it, 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 i think it forced change but it was the businesses that adapted to that 
uh, in a positive way and we're unable to look at what they've got in place, what they need to change and how it looks moving forward. You mentioned that hybrid model. Um, yeah, I mean, what does that actually look like right now? Because, you know, where you've got a business that's a multi-billion pound organisation, they've got so many different divisions. And I think where the, where the difficulty comes in is, well, if you've got hybrid in one area and not in another, it could then cause complications. So it's about getting that message right across the whole business as one. Flexibility is key. But I think what I found um, speaking to lots of other businesses out there is uh, um, as long as you've got a clear, concise message and you're operating in the same way and the work is not failing or falling short, you can kind of work either from home or in the office. But um, how's the vibe in terms of getting people back in to sort of collaborate face to face, build internal relationships and things like that? Are you guys promoting that? Are you guys enforcing that? Yeah, we're, we're not enforcing that, but we are promoting that, I think, is, okay. is the right way to look at that. So I think we have seen really positive feedback from a lot of people who enjoy being in the office with their peers and their colleagues. Absolutely. And certainly when we have um, reasons for lots of people to be in at any given time, the feedback is generally really positive that they enjoy it. Brilliant. Um, the same challenge we have with every other business is people find it frustrating when they come into the office and no one else is there for them to collaborate with and they sit down and do the job they could do at home and it seems like a yeah. you know, significant waste of journey time and so forth so the key really is to make sure that teams can be in at the similar time and people that you want to engage with and see are in at the similar time to make make that journey to the office valuable um it certainly evolved from the office being a place where you come and sit and just maybe do task-based work to being a place where you come in to collaborate and meet with people that's that's the shift and it's promoting yeah. that in in the ways that we sort of manage people and expect when they're in, when they're not in and, and in together. Secondly, it's an investment in your office facilities. You know, we've just invested significant um, amount of money and continue to do so in refurbing, not just our headquarters in Birmingham, but also our London office, Brilliant. Um, our office and various offices. And we're making sure that that space is fit for the purpose that it now needs to be. Yeah. Uh, and that the tools are there to support hybrid working because you're always going to have some people that aren't in the physical building so you need to make sure that the the people at home don't become the second class citizen um in, in a video call or so forth so the tools need to be there um and, and we need to just promote people who you know want to be in the office but still retain flexibility you know i think that's good that's here to stay yeah um, absolutely so it's empowering them to do that and so far i think that's working working really well um the, the feedback seems to be fairly positive naturally we have different roles that have different needs. So some roles have to have physical presence and some roles don't. And to your yeah. point with a big business with lots of departments and lots of roles, we, we, need to, we need to obviously consider that and how different roles play out differently and support people in different ways. Yeah. But uh, we've, we've certainly found certain things with a bit more fun in the office and providing certain uh, enhanced benefits of people being in the office has been well received as well. Brilliant. No, I, I love it, actually. And, and I love what you said there in terms of, uh, um, you know, when people get into the office, uh, there's kind of got to be a purpose, right? You don't want to just sit there on your own, you know, doing what you could do at home. But, you know, when you are getting to the office, opportunity to, you know, build internal relationships and, and just, I suppose, integrate on a more personal level. Um, yeah. You know, I think that leads on to your point where, you know, then got to invest in the culture, the people, the environment, you know, the offices. Um, you know, the tools and technology is one thing, but let's face it, we can do that in the office or remote, given the technologies we work with now. But when they come into the office to collaborate, um, dare I say it, have fun, you know, almost sort of remove themselves at times from the work sort of duties and just build, you know, that sort of personal face to face relationship. You kind of want to feel that it's a nice environment. You want to feel that the offices are, you know, pleasant, et cetera. And, uh, and that culture, I think I think that's what was one of the big refreshing things out of, you know, getting people back into the office. It made the business look internally. Or companies looking to and go well if we can now say right we want people to come to the office every now and again to build relationships let's make it a nice environment right you know let's let's you know let's invest in the actual uh office um you know and, and the fun stuff along with all the technology and tools that they can use anywhere around the world right um yeah, yeah no I, I just find that the days that i'm in the office i tend to be coming home later and later because i'm spending more time catching up with people like you just don't get those touch points when you're um on back to back video calls right you don't have the five minutes here five minutes there. you don't bump into people when you start home in your office um, like this so um i think making sure that when you're in the office you have some of that free time for the ad hoc pieces is really important um Definitely. that's where a lot of the value is right in the business relationships and the people 
hundred percent. And look, we're doing it here as well. Um, you know, we're, we're office based, and to be fair, we offer a, a flexible working environment. But everyone wants to come in and um, and just bounce ideas off, and just you know, create energy and enthusiasm and all that kind of good stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it is it's it's definitely about having that purpose. And 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 when you are in, you know, uh, you can just build far better relationships. I'm saying to everyone now get out you know they're going right i've got a team set up well if you ask for a face-to-face they're like oh yeah right <laughs> i should probably do that i'm like look we can now meet people get out go and meet customers candidates and you know build what you just said that that different rapport you know that opportunity to get under the under the skin of people in a more personable way opposed to it just sort of being very transactional right here we go quick meeting see you later so yeah no i love it no cool and, and in terms of sort of core usps at the moment in 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 in, in in the market for 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 SCC, how, how are you guys sort of positioning your core U, USPs? Yeah, I mean, I think if you listen to our clients and, and hear what they say about us, there's 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 many many things that they like about SCC, which is why many of them have a relationship for you know with SCC for decades. Um, yeah, I think I think what SCC gives customers is it's it's a big and broad business, right? So. In this world where many customers are looking to consolidate some of the suppliers, because it's hard to manage dozens and dozens and dozens of different suppliers with different terms, to be able to come to a business like SCC where your IT estate is large and it is complex, and for one business to be able to understand and be able to service you across that broad estate is really valuable to a lot of our customers, and it's what's helped grow the relationship. I think the fact that we're a privately owned business as well. I mean, if you think just in the innovation space today, most of what our customers would say these smaller businesses that may be deemed to be, you know, innovating at pace because mm. they have no legacy, that's great. But when you partner with those businesses, naturally you're probably expecting at some point in the near future they're either going to, on a negative garbage, on a positive be sold or acquired. Um, and yeah, that obviously absolutely. In terms of both the relationships and the services that you provide. So, the thing with SCC is it doesn't have that concern for our clients. Obviously, it's it's been around for a long time. It's, it's very financially stable. Um, the owners, so the family owners of the business, and, and I'll come on to how family permeates through SCC, but the family owner of the business often say something which is quite um, unusual to hear, which is almost a 100-year vision. There is a vision that this business is in this industry serving these clients in 100 years' time. Love There's it. not many IT businesses that would even think that way or say those words and i think absolutely that gives a huge amount of stability to our customers to say if we're making bets on each other then sec is a very very stable bet to to you know, to, to to partner with um naturally we need to innovate and we need to keep pace with where our customers need to go and i think that's the other thing where sec have some usps in this space being privately owned the ability to invest and invest with agility allows us to do things in an innovative way that's a bit more constrained in businesses depending on their financial structure and ownership. Yeah. Certainly if you're publicly owned or if you're private S or VC owned, obviously access to that funding, it's not your money to make decisions on, right? There's there's chains of decision making. Um, being privately owned does allow SEC, I, I believe, to obviously be very flexible in that regard. And I think that allows us to start creating things that are quite innovative. We can um, we can experiment in that regard and we can start doing things which we're hearing from our customers and things they want to do. So I think some, some aspect of that is what really brings out some of the, the core value that you hear from our customers outside of the fact that the point around family is one of our core values within SCC, family-owned business, but that permeates through the business. I think yeah. the staff feel it. We have a huge number of staff with long tenure in the business, which is fantastic. And I think they feel this sense of being part of the family and that, that extends to our customers. And our customers tell us that they feel part of the SEC family and, and you know, the business has demonstrated year over year over a long period of time that they go above and beyond to support our clients. Um, yeah. When you get that feeling, it creates a very, very strong relationship. Brilliant. I, I love it. And, and, and the way you mentioned family, I mean, you know, for, for, for the wider group, the audience, I mean, you know, when you think of SEC, you think of this sort of multi-billion pound sort of IT solution by the 65 plus countries. And, you know, someone might not think about that family sort of uh, more personable touch within the business. And I love what you said, because, you know, that's really important for people that are, you know, um, joining SEC, thinking about joining SEC that, you know, it's not always just numbers and, and size and countries. Actually, it's, you know, what makes that business enables them to get to that size you know a family-run 
sort of felt business, you know, um, independently, privately owned. And yeah, just that culture driving, you know, driving performance through culture and, and well-being, which, uh, yeah, which I absolutely love. Really glad that you mentioned that. And, uh, you know, you mentioned sort of uh, technology and being innovative and, and creative and falling at the forefront of the latest cutting edge tech. So, you know, what, what technology do you think will be the most disruptive <laughs> in the market, you know, in the next 12 months? Uh, we've got a few, right? Um, okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a technologist at heart. I'm in this industry because I'm just super passionate about how technology helps customers achieve yeah. better, better outcomes, right? That's, that's why I'm here. Live and breathe every day. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly fascinated and amazed by what technology can do for our customers and what we see happening in the marketplace with that. And, and that's you know, a great part of being, being part of SCC and helping customers do that. But you look at the disruption of technology that's coming. There's not so much something that I think is going to drop in the next 12 months that fundamentally change the landscape. I think it's kind of here, but it's the adoption of it and increased usage of certain things, which is driving the change of the outcomes. And okay. I think the increased pace of change of some of those adoptions are driving obviously fundamental changes in the way people do business and the way people work. And that's what we... That's what we see. We, because we live it and breathe it every day, you have to sometimes take a step back. So in 12 months' time, you take a step back and think, wow, that's all happened within a year. It's quite fundamental. Yeah. Um, but even, look, look, if I give you an answer, I think, how would I do this? I often say this at work. If we say ground upwards, what's a massive trend that I've seen at the minute? Obviously, a huge amount of data centers being built, a huge amount of infrastructure state data applications moving to the cloud in various forms, right? The guys at Microsoft and at Amazon and Facebook and Google, they can't build data centers quick enough. Yeah, yeah. A, huge, a huge amount of innovation in that space. But fundamentally, there's something on the horizon that we've talked about for many, many years, which is quantum computing. And if you're talking about a a disruptive technology as and when something starts becoming mainstream in that space it fundamentally changes the footprint and the landscape of how we have to build these mega mega data centers it would be yeah. a fundamental shift and would have a fundamental impact so there's something coming in that data center space at some point where it does change the way we traditionally stack up compute 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 to to um cater for that insatiable need that we have out there for computing power um, now, there's loads of innovations going on in our data and space in terms of how we call them and how we manage them, but this that would have a fundamental shift. Um, yeah. I think when you move up the stack, we're sort of seeing, obviously, this continued shift to public cloud, where we're seeing skills change, where you're not so much managing the infrastructure, but you're actually definitely more focused on the application and the workload. And that yeah. just drives a fundamental shift. You go back 10 years ago, and Microsoft used to say a stat that was Typically, 70% of a business's IT budget is spent on the infrastructure and keeping lights on. So you're only spending yep. third stuff that adds value. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. This is changing. That is changing and it is shifting. And, you know, people are moving away from having to manage the nuts and bolts because that's taken care of. And you focus more on everything is becoming as code. I use a term which is the application is king. You know, it is the workload that is valuable. You get to spend more time on it. And then that drives more innovation and how it actually adds value into a business. And that's picking up, you know, that's picking up pace and change. So the more that we focus on that area, the more impact we have in the business. Um, and then I probably couldn't not answer the question without touching on, I've purposely not used buzzwords of, you know, IoT and machine learning and all of that stuff. But data, right, is we are harnessing an incredible amount of data. It is growing phenomenally, but yeah. most of us are just storing that data because we okay. can it's relatively cheap. Very few businesses, there's some great examples, but very few businesses today are really harnessing that data for anything valuable, insights, intelligence, anything else. And we're going to see that fundamentally change in the next decade where that data that we are saving now and we are going to continue to save an incredible amount more um, is going to allow such clever things to be done with it to provide insights and intelligence that we just do not have today. And it will yep. fundamentally shift the way that we go about things and do things. So, you know, we know that's coming and we know some of the technologies are already there. It's actually a case of adopting them and getting the use out of them. So it's really exciting when I look forward to the next decade, what an industry to be involved in. Absolutely. And I love your passion for it as well. And, and, and I know that question sometimes almost like is said as if you, you've got to pick one tech out. And I love that you didn't because, you know, it's kind of like it's a collaboration of technologies you know, yeah. that will naturally evolve, um, but it's about capturing them at the right time and knowing when to adopt and implement. And I love it. You know, you summed that up instead of saying, right, it's just this area. Well, actually, it's a collaboration of multiple areas 
but making sure that through adoption, um, you know, that is uh, uh, increased through change, you know, implementing at the right at the right time, at the right pace when the need is there for the customers. So, yeah, I love it. Watch this space around quantum tech and data center. <laughs> Wicked. Um, cool. And, and, and then, look, moving away from technology slightly now, um, you know, we touched very briefly on, you know, COVID and, you know, hybrid model and things like that. And, and I always ask everyone this, um, you know, how do you go about building that, 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 that culture, you know, a productive, you know, culture, whether it be internally or externally or, or both, right? Because that's what we, that's the world we live in right now. Yeah, and, and look, we're in the you know, middle of what we're doing here. So with SCC Hyperscale and SCC Cyber, two businesses that were really growing into these two um, areas of the market that are significantly growing themselves. Um, mm. we're, building, we're building teams here at Pace, hiring a lot of people. We're having to bring them in and establish a culture and how they obviously get the best out of themselves and how they work with their peers and their team. And, and for me, I, I kind of, if I was to boil it down and say, a productive culture or, you know, I quite like the word performance culture. Um, there's kind of three things that I focus on probably personally with the team. Um, a big one that I'm really passionate about is right people in right roles. I think you spend all your working week, you know, most of your time is work. You need to be able to get to the end of the week and have spent more time doing the things that energize you than you spend time doing the things that be motivate you. Yeah. It's critical to be able to find a role that allows you to do that. Um, and Absolutely. you see it. My, you know, I ask people when I'm interviewing them, or I ask people when they're working, go, what's the thing that really puts the biggest smile on your face by the end of a given week or a given day? Do you get to do that enough in your job? If not, and you're really good at doing that, that should be the thing you do more of. Yeah, absolutely. If we get more people doing the things that they're passionate about most of the time, naturally that sort of breeds success it breeds productivity it breeds happy people all those things work together um the second thing for me is probably relationships you know i say a great relationship solves for 10 broken processes right it, it just cuts through things when you have a relationship with your peers and your colleagues and that's something that's quite hard to do in a business where you've got five thousand people yeah but it doesn't mean you don't try right because there's still lots of relationships that you do need to have you don't necessarily know everyone perhaps but you still need to have strong relationships so a big focus on making sure people understand people that are slightly more uh slightly more a level slightly above just i know what they do in their job at work I mean, yeah that's not advantageous but just having a little bit of personality within the working like you know working week and certainly with my management team when we talk about good news on a on a friday and what's been happening it's not just work, it's what's good news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's work, and I think that's really important because people will always answer that question with work-based stories. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, and, and look, both those points are so, so key. You know, you, you talk about relationships and, you know, you're never going to know everyone inside and out, but I think it's the, making the effort and just showing a genuine interest to, when there is an opportunity to get, know, get to know someone better. Yeah, just take that time out to to get to know on a, on a, on a personal level, and uh, yeah, no, no, I love it. I mean, it's it's something that's uh, yeah. I think I think it's always difficult, no matter how how big or small you are. You know, just trying to get you know, what's the perfect culture. I think it suits one area, then it's completely different in another. So, James, a little bit more about you, um, uh, and then we got some uh, sort of quick ten fire questions just to finish off. Um, so, your 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 biggest success uh, sort of story to date. I, you know, I, I look at this as over the last decade plus working in uh, numerous great businesses, just being super proud to have built, you know, some really great teams of which I'm still, you know, great friends with many of those people. Yeah. Uh, have, have built some great capabilities which have benefited many, many, many of our customers. And I always look back at successes of being things that we've done for customers where the customer's been extremely over the moon with what we've done because it's genuinely helped them. Um and there's many stories like that, and I won't name specific customers for the task, but I, you know, I look back at that and I think if we've been able to harness you know, something in this technology sphere and do something for a client, and we've landed on that outcome, that's really helped them shift their business forward. I probably don't feel any better than that at the end of a given week. And I'm very fortunate that with the roles I've done and the teams we've built and the areas we've worked, we've, we've had many examples of that over the years. Brilliant. I love it. It's that job satisfaction where you actually add real value to a customer and yeah, and see and experience firsthand, you know, how that's made a huge difference to that customer. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and in terms of handling change, demands of tech, 
um, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but, you know, um, how, how do you personally handle, you know, the demand in, or the change of demand in tech? I think if you're passionate about the area in which you work, you tend to have an ambition to learn more. And I think yeah. the key thing about dealing with change is the ability to want to learn. Um, yeah. If you're open to constantly exploring what's new and, and what's going on out there, you typically don't feel too concerned about the change because it's interesting to you. Yeah. So on a personal level, and I try and obviously instill this down into any of the businesses that I work, if we find the right people who are passionate about the things that they're doing, you just see a constant desire to, to learn. And then you do Love see it. a desire to drive change, which is obviously all positive. So that would be one of the bits we kind of feed into the culture. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I love it. And I think it comes down to passion energy, right? You know, skills and experience can be taught and gained. But, you know, if you're not passionate about the area that you work in and the technology that you want to, I suppose, progress uh, and develop, then, uh, yeah, you're probably not going to make it or get to the level that, you know, is expected of you. Cool. OK. And then um, <clears throat> not in terms of uh, what, what advice, what advice would you give to others looking to get into technology or, or the MSP solution by the world? Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about the comment you just made, right, find the thing that you're passionate about. Mm. So technology doesn't have to be nuts and bolts technology, as I you know, refer to it in terms of there's lots of people who are passionate about the things that they get to build and the things they get to do. Other people are really passionate about how they help a customer navigate a really complex market landscape and obviously understand the right solution that's fit for them. So it's, it, we talk about technology, it doesn't have to be technical, but it has to be the thing that you are passionate about. And I think if you can find the thing that you're passionate about, that's you know that's what's going to drive you to success in a given role. If you think about terms of approach, um, I would say don't think about it too much and get stuck in. Um, it's like this, this market moves so quickly, you have to be quick on your feet and you have to be willing yeah. to try things. So if you try something, and we use a term often in the industry, but, you know, fail fast, right? I, I genuinely believe in it. It's a case of you're not going to get everything right. You are going to have to fail. So get on with it and fail fast. And then next time around, you'll know exactly what to do 10 times better, 10 times quicker. Love so, it. you know, just a couple of sort of, I guess, pieces that I would live by in terms of how I'd approach, approach the, the market. Brilliant. I love it. Look, fail fast, right? Make it happen. Uh, you know, learn from your mistakes and uh, yeah, drive it forward through passion and energy. Yeah, brilliant. Cool. Okay. And then what would you, uh, you know, what do you uh, admire? Uh, if you were to, who do you, who do you admire most in the, in the, uh, in the sector? You know, whether it be a person, well, I won't say company, because uh, I know that one, it's SCC. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the company one's a good lens, right? Because if I look back and say technology market over the last 20 years has been, it, it shifted fundamentally. And I think you look at some companies, look at Microsoft and say, what a fantastic job they've done in the last 20 years to pivot from a software business that provided software on your laptop to a services, one of the leading services business in the world providing services across global data centers. Yeah, that pivot for a company that size yeah. is, and, and how successfully they've done it is incredible. And then I look at other businesses, I'm constantly looking at businesses thinking, how do they do what they do and how have they been successful? Um, and you look at, there's so many unicorn businesses that have reached a billion dollar valuation across all sorts of industries. You know, um, we see a lot in financial tech, we see a lot in health tech, we see a lot in education, there's lots of them. And they're all got fantastic stories, which yeah. is great that you peel back the onion. But just pick some of the big market leading names that we've all sort of seen, you, you know, Amazon have disrupted the retail market using technology. They've used yeah. technology to revolutionize that market space and, and they've reaped the rewards for doing so. Fantastic example. Airbnb was a unicorn business in the hospitality sector. Um, Uber in the transportation sector. Tesla in the automotive sector. Yeah. Netflix in the entertainment sector. You know, they all have done the same fundamental thing, which is leveraged new technology as it's become available to disrupt the traditional marketplace. And by doing so, they've gained significant market share and become huge, huge businesses. And that's part of what is the opportunity in technology, which is you're connecting supply and demand with technology. There's mm. people who want to buy something and there's people who want to sell it. Yeah. You come up with an innovative way of using technology to connect those two big markets together 
and you end up being Elon Musk. Oh, I love it. Such good insights, mate. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, an opportunity to be positively disruptive I got from that. So uh, one of Improview's values. Yeah, no, fantastic. Honestly, uh, there's been some great insights there, James. Um, I do want to finish things off um, with uh, just 10 short, quick fire questions. Uh, just uh, some of them a little bit fun. Um, so which which three people would you uh, most like to invite to dinner? <laughs> well. I suppose I should pick from the previous conversation some of the leaders in the technology space over the last 20 years, things that we've admired them quite a lot. You know, there's obviously Bill Gates from my start of my career. There's Love it. Elon Musk would be probably an entertaining character of light. Um, and Jeff Bezos would be quite interesting, wouldn't he? But I'm sure there's much more interesting people as well from the political landscape and his you know historical stories that you would get but let's let's keep it with the theme of the technology let's go there. I, I missed the last one what was the third one i think we landed on jeff didn't we from yeah. amazon perfect love it That's god well look there's three in, it, three three inspirational industry leaders there so uh, that'd definitely be a fun meal cool uh microsoft or apple i think i know the answer to this <laughs> yeah i think it's microsoft for me perfect football or rugby rugby lovely good man who'd you sport um I, well i used to live in Cheltenham, so i used to get to gloucester a little bit okay lovely good uh degree or apprenticeship interesting um i have a degree and i think it's been super valuable but obviously the world is changing and i think there's a lot of value in apprenticeships and, and the way that people can get into industry so i'm i'm not torn either way agreed agreed so one thing or passion or hobby that uh, most people wouldn't know about you <laughs> wouldn't know about me well everyone knows i can't play golf very well so that's probably not unknown um <laughs> uh it is it's a i actually am quite a hands-on person when it comes to doing you know i wouldn't call it diy but i enjoy building things perfect okay so putting up cabinets or shelves <laughs> anything that gives a sense of practicality because you certainly from you know i enjoy technology but you do sit in front of it all day long don't you Love it. Chance to do a bit of DIY when you, uh, when you can then. Favourite so, technology of the last 20 years? Wow. The internet. Yeah, of oh course. Absolutely. Cool. Worst technology. Something if you had a chance to just click your fingers and it just uh, become non-existent. What, I wouldn't have bought a mini disc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pointless. Like, Waste of money. <laughs> fall into a chasm. Those are the example of ones that didn't cross the, cross the chasm. Cool. Best thing uh, about working in the channel in one sentence? It's always the people. Perfect. Worst thing or most difficult? Let's say that. Most difficult thing about working in the channel? I know, it's difficult when you can't answer that question, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, it's a small place. A lot of people know each other. It, it's great. Um, I really don't, I don't think I have a negative about working in this space. And I obviously, anyone I speak to, I encourage them to to consider working in this space themselves. So, you know. Perfect answer. Love it. Uh, a motto uh, that you live by or a strap line? Oh, good question. Um, be passionate about what you do. Brilliant. Yeah, love it. Uh, one thing you would like to have been known for, you know, uh, at the beginning of your career? I think being a good leader. I think being able to lead people and be decent, honest, um, help people achieve their ambitions um and help our customers achieve theirs i think that would be something that i would take away brilliant love it perfect well james once again thank you so much for taking time out i know you're super busy and uh yeah it's been really insightful really refreshing um to all of our audience and viewers uh, i hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as i have once again james hennigan md uh within uh, hyperscale and cyber across scc um if you guys uh, want to comment, like, share, or, um, you know, just ask James any questions, uh, feel free to uh, comment below. Uh, once again, James, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, I'll speak to you soon, buddy. Bye for now. Bye-bye.